Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to get started right now. So this uh, webinar, the um, sorry, the purpose where this is our introduction to IAB uh, network layout. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to design um, a network that contains multiple device level rings and I'm going to connect them together using IAB. So I wanted to start by bringing uh, your attention to this. So this is a document. Uh, it's part of the CPWE. Uh, if you haven't heard of CPWE before, it stands for Converge Plant Wide uh, Ethernet. It's a standard that was developed by Cisco and Rockwell uh, and Panduit as well. Uh, and the purpose of this is to put standards in place for the Ethernet on the plant floor. So there's a couple different portions of this. Uh, there's a portion related to the machines and how you're going to connect cabling together within that machine and connect machines together and bring that connection up to the enterprise level of the facility as well as an IDMZ and a couple other uh, patients or sorry portions as well. So this is a fairly lengthy document. This piece is just the DLR portion or device level ring. By the way, I will shorten things with acronyms. If you have any questions, there is a Q&A window on the side of this Teams platform. You can ask them as yourself or you can ask them anonymously. Uh, we do actually don't get the information afterwards if you do ask them anonymous, anonymously, so ask away. I will try to remember to explain any uh, new acronyms that I bring into place. So device level ring, uh, this document. So it does give you an overview and this is the device level ring architecture. If you're unfamiliar with it, as I said, it covers everything down from the plant floor all the way up into your enterprise network. Right, so down here is your cell area zone, so level zero to two, level zero devices. This is all based on the Purdue model. So level zero devices being your controls and instrumentation all the way up into your smarter devices, your switches, and into your enterprise level operations and software packages. There's a great section here that's bookmarked as well on design considerations, uh, as well as going into the configuration, monitoring, and troubleshooting. When it comes to DLR, Stratic switches are the only switches you'll find that have that DLR capability and the different switches, whether it's a 5700 or 5400, I'll get into that a bit later, will denote how many different uh, DLR networks you can connect to. And there is also a nice little acronym list here as well. So after this webinar wa wraps up, I'll send the download link for this PDF out to all the attendees as well so that you'll have this uh, going forward if you need to reference it. Okay, so what I've got set up here is this is Integrated Architecture Builder, IAB. I'm going to go through uh, a new project and I'll show you the process that I go through when I'm setting something up. So I'm going to hit a new project and I'm going to name it Network Demo. Here you'll find your location where that file is going to be stored. And I like to bring everyone's uh, attention to this part as well. So enable Workspace Autosave every two minutes. I really like to have that on there. Uh, this is just something I've developed over the years. It's almost like a nervous tick. I hit save every two or three minutes when I'm working on something, as I'm sure a lot of you do, if you've been burned in the past by uh, software crashing and losing your progress. So you can set this value to whatever you want. I always make sure that it's checked on my files. So there are a couple different templates here you can start with. In this case, I'm gonna start with a blank workspace and go from there. So this is what our blank workspace will look like, and this will bring us into the wizard view. If you attended Amanda's introduction to IAB webinar last week, she went through some of the features in here. So I'm going to build a compact logic system, and I'm going to use the wizard view as well. I find it's a really great place to start if you're not sure of which platform to go with, or if you very quickly want to add on uh, your PLC and your cards. So for this case, I'm going to choose the 5069 PLC. If you haven't used the 5069 Compact Logics before or aren't familiar with it, sometimes it's referred to as well by its series name, which is 5380. It's the new generation Compact Logics. It actually has two Ethernet ports on board. One of them, uh, you know, they can be separated out into two separate IP addresses, or they can be linked together to form part of this DLR. In this case, I'm going to use it as a DLR, but I'll also show you the functionality where you can enable that dual IP mode. Whenever you add anything, you will have this network creation area. So you've got a couple options down here. So you've got the option to only create a network if you're adding on multiple IO or create it regar uh, regardless of that. And then when you have your Ethernet, there's a drop down here. 
So if you want to conform to that CPWE model, which you've got here, uh, you would check that box, but the CPWE model will enforce, oh, let me just get down to the diagram, it'll enforce that you stick to what's on this diagram. So it'll have these uh, cells and areas already pre-populated in there. Just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a freeform model. The freeform just lets you put things wherever you want on the page and doesn't enforce sticking to that standard. And then you've got an option here for the different types of topology. So if you set uh, it up to a star topology, so you're just going to branch out and everything's directly connected to a switch, you would choose a new switch. I'm going to choose device level ring from this dropdown. So what you'll notice is it automatically takes the switch out of this option because either you're using a device level ring or a device level linear network, which is what you kind of see happening here. You don't need a switch in that uh, architecture. So I'm going to choose device level ring. And in this case, I don't really need any IO. I more concentrate on the network, but you would fill this in based on your IO count if you wanted to get an accurate picture of how the network traffic is going to look on this, this configuration. So it's given me the L306 ER processor, which can connect to eight additional IO nodes. I'm okay with that, so I'm gonna go ahead and click finish. Now, anytime you complete one of these processor wizards, it's going to pop up this question afterwards. The question is, would you like to add distributed I.O. to be controlled by that processor? So do you have remote I.O. panels located around uh, the facility that you would like to connect into that? I'm going to click yes, and I'm going to choose that this I.O. is going to be controlled by this processor, and I'm going to use the existing network, and it's going to be on that device level ring. So you have the option here to choose the new device level ring, or you'll see here ring 001, which was the device level ring network created when we created this uh, processor over here. So now I've added so that this uh, Ethernet IO is now connected to this processor on the same ring network. I'm just gonna go ahead and click through these as well. I'm not concerned with the IO. Uh, and bring your attention to the series up here. So actually, when we were at the first page, let me hop back here. This uh, classification guide, you see all the green check boxes? That'll show all of the network adapters that are compatible with the family or with the processor here that we have selected. So this is the different choices of I.O. that we can use. So when I get all the way to my last page, I actually have multiple different types of platforms I can choose. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the 5069 IO that matches the same family. So from here, I can further specify which type of network adapter I'd like to use. So the 5069 family has two uh, adapters, the AENTR and the AEN2TR. The difference between them, the AENTR is a slim version, whereas the AEN2TR is about the same size as the Compact Logics model itself. So it has a scrolling display on the front, which will display the IP address. So you'll see here, this is my description of the AENTR. And when I change this to the AEN2TR, you can see here four digit scrolling display is also shown on there. Just for the visual sake, I'm gonna go ahead and choose the AENTR and click finish. Now, one thing you'll notice, it will keep asking you this question because it's going to give you the option if you've got a project that you've already spec'd out and you know the number of IO in each remote panel, you would just keep clicking yes and fill in that wizard as you go. I'm gonna click no because I don't wanna add additional IO, but it's just important to note that pop-up will keep coming up to encourage you or to easily make it so you can add this distributed IO as you go through it. So I like to bring attention to the different tabs on the left-hand side of IAB as we go through this. Uh, so for example, right now, this is the wizard view where we started off. I'm gonna head on over to the architect, or sorry, the hardware view. And the hardware view is going to show the hardware that was just created uh, by going through that wizard. So here is my compact logics. So the 5069 or 5380 compact logics. And here's my slim ethernet adapter. So you'll see there's no additional cards as I didn't select any in the wizard. I could add them in here now if I wanted to add on an IO card. Oh, let me try that again. That was spinning on me. So if I wanted to add in any IO cards, I could do that here. 
Again, that's actually safety because I don't have a safety processor, but I can just go ahead and drag these in here. And the features with IAB, it's going to automatically give me those warning notifications that I haven't conducted a power supply, so it can't perform that calculation to know if I have enough power available. And you'll see it's also put in the FPD, so that field potential distribu distribution module between the AC input and the analog input to provide uh, that buffer zone between those two different IO cards. So from here, I'm going to head over to my network view. And I'll minimize this window now that I've shown you all of those tabs. So this is my network view. This is the compact logics that I've created. And right here is the uh, remote IO that I put in here. I use the term remote IO. I know it's not a remote IO network, uh, but distributed IO is sometimes harder to remember to say. <laughs> Um, but this is our distributed I.O. panel. So if this was a small job where it's just the simple DLR, you've got your PLC and you've got your distributed I.O. block, you know, this would be uh, this would be complete, right? As we know, though, every job that you start, you, the scope ends up growing. So, for example, you know, this started off as a small machine uh, and, you know, it's grown into something larger. So if I wanted to duplicate this, I have the option to right click and duplicate this device and it's going to bring up a window and ask me how many duplicate devices I would like to create. So instead of going back through that wizard or instead of in this hardware view clicking add new hardware and selecting that from a list, if I already have a bunch of cards on here that are pre-selected with what I need and I'm just duplicating that same rack, I can right click and duplicate and add on multiple more devices. So you'll see what it's done is add them on horizontally, and this isn't the most visually appealing look. Now you could go through here and rearrange them. But what I hope you're seeing right now is all of my lines are crisscrossed. And again, as a lot of us I'm sure are all visual creatures, this isn't a very accurate depiction of a ring. So there's a couple different ways we can change this view so it's a bit more aesthetically pleasing. From the mode area up here, this is the select mode that we start off in to move this hardware around, but this one here is the connect mode. So this allows us to actually move the cables from where they're connected and move them around a lot more easily. So if I wanted to uncross these wires, I can do it that way. But also when you're in this connect mode, as you move the hardware around, it'll fix those wires as well. What's really nice, and I'll show you later when you have multiple rings, if you want to move them Elsewhere in the connect mode, this device will connect to the, the closest network to it. So in this case, this is the ring. So for me, at least, I know this is a lot more easy to visualize uh, for myself. So now we can actually see the ring network. And for the device level ring, uh, just you know, a bit of terminology, it's managed by the devices. There will be a device supervisor. So in this case, this compact logics will be the supervisor. And the ring portion is it's coming out of one port into the next, into the next, and so on. So if you're using device level ring with either our panel views or factory talk view SE, there are customizable faceplates that you can download. And when you bring these faceplates in, uh, they will connect to this processor using an add-on instruction and the faceplate will automatically pull the information from the DLR network. So if you were to be using a P uh, panel view right now and click on the DLR network, it'll automatically build this up for you based on the node that these are set up in the network and it will show you whether they're online and offline and show you which one as well is your DLR supervisor. So that's this guy here. So in terms of functionality, you might look at this and if you know something about networking, you might say, well, wait a minute, this is a ring. How do you prevent something called a broadcast storm? So a broadcast storm is when you have a loop exactly like this. You know, a broadcast storm, the data will come out of one port and just keep going around and you'll see the packets being resent. So this is a, spe a special type of network. What actually happens in this DLR supervisor is it monitors the network health and actually closes off this one port. So for example, the secondary port, even though the cable is connected, that port will be disabled and that allows the data to actually function and go around the ring in this path. Now, if there were a break in the ring, so for example, at this area, if this cable was cut and connected, 
the data would come this far, notice there's a problem, circle back and tell the supervisor, you know, the supervisor would get those diagnostics, it would open up this port and allow the ring to function this way. So in terms of how long that takes to happen, it's uh, what's referred to as convergence time and it's about 50 milliseconds. So that's what we have in terms of our recovery time if you do disconnect a cable within a DLR network. So that is very fast when you think about it and it's usually sufficient for most industrial networks. All right, so here we've got a ring, we've got five IO points. So this is what we did with this project. Now there's a couple other features that are built into IAB when it comes to networking. You might have seen when I held my mouse over there, you've got a VLAN there and you've got the address. Each one of these devices is actually automatically given an address as well. So what we can do is through these UI options or user interface options, we can turn on some additional features that are kind of hidden from us at the moment. So one here is cable length. So you might wonder why you would want to turn on the cable properties through here. Well, you can actually go in here and by, oh, sorry, I broke out the ring. I'll come back to that later. By actually clicking on this here and going to trunk cable media type, you can configure this trunk cable uh, segment and you can actually adjust the distances between these. So one of the benefits of doing you know, this per segment um, a big huge benefit is for anyone installing this, I'll show you when I pull the report later, that you're ensuring that there's the right distance between these, you're ordering the right amount of the right length of cables or the right amount of cables, and to eliminate that user error. For example, if someone's connecting, you know, the, the right port out of this I.O. module into this module here and they're using a two meter cable, well, are you really connecting to the correct one? Right, it's helping us with those design standards and enforcing that for a consistent delivery. He's also you know, have the option up here to show the address info. So these are the addresses that are automatically assigned. And then as well here, node numbers within that DLR network. And finally, warnings. So there's a lot of information that's uh, available to show. So I'm gonna turn off a few of these and just keep on the address section. So what a lot of people don't know or uh, haven't been made aware to utilize some of this with DLR or any of the features within IAB, so, sorry, you can set up your VLANs and you can set up your addressing scheme here and then you can export this information either into Rockwell's uh, Logix Architect or at least to give this to your programmers or whoever's going to be setting these things up on site so they've got that address scheme ahead of them and to help with the switch configuration. So I'm going to actually click on here and I'm going to change VLAN. Now I can do that by right clicking and changing on the VLAN or I can do it up here, bring up my VLAN network or my VLAN list. So I'm going to add some VLANs here. So VLAN one is going to be the native VLAN for any networks or any switches that you have in here. I'm going to add in or actually edit this one so this is going to be my machine one and there's an underscore here uh, you can't have spaces in the VLAN name so my machine one is going to have an IP addressing scheme of 192.168.10.0 okay and as my scope has grown I've actually been asked to add additional machines on here so I've got machine number two, which I'm going to make VLAN 20. Now these numbers for VLANs are arbitrary. You would make them whatever you want. The key is to stick to consistency so that anyone is very uh, easily able to see uh, and understand what you're doing here and to make your life easier as well so that you'll be able to troubleshoot a lot easier. So 168.30. So hopefully you can see my scheme there. So these were on VLAN 2. I'm going to have them end up on VLAN 10 for machine 1 and click OK. It's going to prompt me now to ask by changing the VLAN of this network, the VLAN and the addresses of all nodes are going to be affected. Do you want to continue? And I'm going to say yes. So you'll see what I've got here, 192.168. It's now 10.4 because it exists on this VLAN. I'm also going to change the name of this ring to say machine one DLR. So I can now easily see this is the DLR for machine one. And as you just saw, I've added machine two and three. So this project has grown in scope. 
I'm going to select all. I'm going to copy everything selected and I'm going to paste it over here. So as this project has grown, I now have machine two. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this to the machine two DLR so I can easily visualize that. But you'll see it doesn't automatically change that VLAN for me. All of these devices are going to be assumed to be on the same VLAN. So what I'm going to do is click on it, right click, change the VLAN to machine two, which you can see is not in use. And you'll see these addresses change from 192.168.10.10 to 20. So this is now 10.4 and 20.4. So this is really nice. I'll be able to see right away which PLC I'm talking to. I know if it's 192.168.10, it's going to be any of my devices on my machine one. And if it's 192.168.20, it's on my machine two. Now all of these addresses, as I said, are auto assigned. So you can overwrite that and change the device's address. So if I right click on here, I can go to the connection and change my address. So if I want to force this device to instead be 10.99, I can do so. So you can manually set the addresses to the scheme that you might already have in place if you have uh, standards for the facility that you're going into. You also have the option to move this device. As I was saying before, if you're in connect mode and you move this device from machine one, where it was 10.99, I can just drag it over to machine two and it gets a new IP address. So 20.10, which is the next available address on machine two, or I can go ahead and bring that back over here. One thing to make note of as well when you're doing that, when I move it over here to machine two, I've lost uh, some of the customization. So my cable length still stays there because that was kind of hard coded into the device. But the address that I changed in there of 10.99 has gone back to 10.5 because that was the next readily available address on that VLAN. So as I zoom out again, I'm going to create my um, machine number three. So instead of selecting everything, I can right click and I can actually select all devices here. So copy machine to DLR and all connected devices. And then I can paste that down here. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this as well. Oops, sorry, I double clicked. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to machine three device level ring. And you'll see these addresses as well. It's 192.168.10. I'm going to change the VLAN for this to VLAN 3. So what I have here is three separate DLR networks. They're not connected together. They're not talking to one another, and they all have their own independent IP address scheme. So I'm sure you've seen this before where you're either developing a machine and you have to integrate into somebody else's with their networking uh, uh, standards or addressing standards, sorry, or you're doing this on your own project where you have to connect multiple DLRs. So what we cannot do is add any old switch here and connect them together. That's gonna cause a nightmare. Uh, standard switches that don't have DLR capability won't know how to interpret that traffic and will create that broadcast storm. They're not able to act as supervisors. They're not able to interpret all of that data. So what I'm going to need to do here is as this job has grown from three separate machines with their own DLR, which now need to communicate to one another, I'm going to add a managed switch. So there's a lot of features down here when it comes to IAB. There's a bunch of different part numbers and they're all sorted by what type of switch or what capability they have, core distribution, access. If you're not sure, the easiest thing, and this is kind of where I start with everything, is choose this help me spot. <laughs> it's in large all cap text. If you drag in a switch from help me choose an ethernet switch, it's going to give you this guide window where you can very easily choose if you're not sure what type of switch you need. So if you're not sure whether you need, you know, a core distribution or access switch, you can choose manage switch and it's going to list all the different types of manage switches here with this very easy to read kind of matrix. So we've got some filters up here in terms of what we need. So the biggest thing we need is the ability to communicate through DLR. So you'll see there's a bunch of switches on here, but not all of them have a checkbox here for direct DLR. So once I check that box, 
you'll see the two types of switches I have available here. The Stratix 5400 and the Stratix 5700 or the Armor Stratix, which is the on machine I.O. So the biggest difference between the 5700 and the 5400 when it comes to DLR is going to be the amount of DLR networks they can connect to. The 5700 can only connect to one network. So if I were to add a 5700, it could talk to this network and then up into a plant wide network, but it cannot also connect to machine two and machine three. So if you needed to connect into a further plant network, but also integrate into these DLRs, you would put a 5700 on each one of these machines so it can be a part of that DLR and then feed them into a larger switch. But if you need one in this area, say it's in a maintenance office or say, you know, this is a long line and you just want one managed switch for that line, you would choose something from the 5700 family. You've got some other options up here as well that you would want to evaluate. So one of the other ones here is static and inter-VLAN routing. So if these three DLRs on their separate VLANs never need to talk to one another, you do not need this capability. But if there is going to be a case where you would want this PLC to be able to talk to this PLC and this PLC through produce consume tags or through messaging or for any other reason, maybe there's an HMI on this line that needs to be able to talk to the other PLCs as well, you will need to check that box. So inter VLAN routing is what allows the switch to interpret data from multiple VLANs and connect them to one another. And if there's any motion, you would choose SIP sync as an option as well. So you can see my list down here keeps getting shorter as I go through these and check these off. So now I'm at the point where I can make a switch. I'm going to go or make a decision on a switch. I'm going to go ahead and choose here from these port counts, right? So you can see our options. This is our total number of ports, the number of copper, fiber and SFP. So the SFP is the small form factor pluggable unit that you can put in there to make the port either a copper or a fiber port. Keep in mind, though, if you were to choose this switch, which only has SFP ports, you will need to purchase eight SFPs, one for each one of those ports. Where if this is a case where I'm using all copper or RJ45 jacks, I wouldn't want to go with that. So I'm going to go ahead and choose this one here. And so I've selected a switch. So to be able to connect them together, I'm going to go ahead and in connect mode, just draw a line from my switch into these DLRs. So I'm a bit particular when it comes to how I want to visualize some of these things. So just bear with me while I move these around. I like seeing straighter lines than uh, these curvy ones where possible. There we go. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've got a managed switch in the center and these three different VLANs. Now I do have the option of well of configuring this switch. So there's two different ways. I can right click and configure the switch from here or from my left hand side here where I've got all of my different ring uh, networks and my managed switch. I can click on it from here. So that'll bring up the same menu whether I click on it here or I right click and go configure. So if I wanted to change the name of this, I wanted to change the VLAN or the address because this address will be forced uh, to reside in the VLAN that you have it set up as. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new switch VLAN. I'm going to make this VLAN 100 and I'm going to make it 10.10.10. .10. Now you might wonder why I would want to do that. Why would I want to have my switch on a separate VLAN? The reason being if someone's connected to this network, they're not going to easily see this switch. They would have to know of the address for the switch inter VLAN routing would have to be turned on or enabled. So just another uh, layer of security for that. And as well to make managing the switches on this plant floor a bit easier, I would do this as well. So you could change the name as well to where it's going to be located. Oh, sorry. Let me change it here. So this I'm actually going to put in the maintenance office. And can't spell this morning and change the address to 10.10.10. .10 .10. So now I can easily identify the name for the switch. I've got my information. It's on a separate VLAN, different IP address. And from down here, you'll note all the helpful information that's populated for us. So it shows 
which port, so gigabit port uh, two and gigabit port three, which cable length is connected to it, which speed is connected. So whether it's 100 megabit or on this gigabit port, gigabit speed, and it's going to tell us where it's going. So port number two is going to machine three's DLR. Port number three is going to machine one's DLR. The VLANs that those are connected to, and you can see the additional ports down here as well. Okay, so now I've got three separate DLRs and they're all connected through one switch. Now, if again, if things change, if your design changes from this connect mode, if someone decides I'm going to put a 5700 on this DLR, I don't want it connected to this 5400. From the connect mode, you've got little scissors if you ever need to break a link. And then you can go ahead and break a link or reconnect them. So you can do that as needed to manipulate your network. So what I've got set up here is what's referred to uh, as our physical topology. I'm sorry, our logical topology. So logically, this is where all the cables are connected. I'm going to show you how to go and do a physical topology. So where they are physically located, because as you know, this is a beautiful picture. It shows a nice small ring, but this might actually be distributed across an entire machine in multiple enclosures. Right, so it may not look like this. So for troubleshooting from a software perspective, for downloading programs to a PLC or setting the IO or programming the switch, this is everything a programmer needs to know what they're connected to and how it's laid out. But for someone who's installing this hardware in a panel or maybe running cables, this isn't too helpful. So if I go back over here into my architecture view, what a mess. <laughs> So from our architecture view, here's where we would set up the physical uh, layout for these devices. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom out and move all of this to the side because I don't want to deal with it right now. I'm going to go ahead and design my different enclosures and my different areas in this facility. So just bear with me while I draw this out. I'm going to add an area. Uh, for my machine and I can rename this to whatever I want. So this is going to be my machine number one it's area and I've got a main control panel and I've got another enclosure here I'm going to throw one here here now keep in mind if you were doing this for real you'd obviously a bit bit more picky in terms of how things line up I'm trying to do this for demonstration purposes. So maybe this is a machine where we have a couple different operations. So there's a filler area. Hit enter there. Uh, we've got um, a packaging area. We've got a labeling area. And maybe we've got uh, what else can I put on here? A wrapper or something, a different type of area. So now I want to bring everything from machine one over to here. So you can see that labeling that I did on the DLR itself is still right here, machine one DLR. So even though it's all jumbled, I know that this is what I want in this machine. So what I would do now is lay these out based on where I would want to place them. Now you'll see we've got a lot of different names here. If I'm going to go back, I can go into my hardware view and where all of this is laid out, I can rename them to make my life a bit easier. So let's call this our wrapper. Let's rename this to our filler. And you would go through this and use your standard naming conventions as you're doing this. This would be in our packaging area. And can't remember what my other one was. Uh, labeling area. So this would be our labeling IO, and this would be IO that I'm going to put in the main panel. So these names will be reflected both in the network view, you'll see it here, and in the architectural view. So now I'm going to put them where they're supposed to go. So my wrapper goes there, my label goes there, main, hey, I got the packaging and the filler one right. Perfect. Now what about that DLR? How am I supposed to accurately portray to someone that this is device level ring? Uh, how about if I move this into the middle? 
it still doesn't look great. <laughs> this isn't how I would want to show someone how everything's connected from a networking perspective, right? This doesn't give a good overview that it's a ring. It kind of looks like a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. So I have the option here of clicking on reset and it's going to reset the connections to where they physically reside. So once I've reset that DLR, I'm actually, I like putting it on the outside of the machine like that, where it's a bit easier to see, or you have the option of repathing it as well. So if you repath a DLR, you can go through the different devices. And it's going to give you the DLR with those devices. So if I were to drag this out, it's going to have those set up by that path that I did in there. So I'm not a fan. I'm going to go ahead and re. Oh, did I hit repath? I'm going to go ahead and reset. I just wanted to show you the difference between those. And this gives me at least a much nicer overview of where this goes. Right, so you see we still have everything crisscrossed. Bear with me in a second, I will make it nicer. Let me just add in my other areas. So this is going to be my machine two. In this case, I'm going to head and not rename each area. This part is going to be for demonstration purposes only. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to my maintenance area. I'm going to put this switch. Oh, this looks terrible. Don't worry, I promise it will look better shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and put these devices where they're supposed to go. And now keep in mind, you could also, just because these devices are set up in these different areas and they are logically on different VLANs, you could have them in different areas. So I could, bear with me and you'll see what I mean. As I'm dragging these ones over, this won't be the prettiest, but I think it will get the point across. I'm going to bring my DLR onto the outside of my machine. Where's the rest of my network there? It's a little hard to see those grabby handles on my monitor right now. I desperately miss my larger monitor back at the office. All right, so here we've got this wonderful spaghetti nightmare, but keep in mind as this is our network view, Ooh, these need to be fixed as well as I move those all around. This is how things are physically connected, right? The cables going between them. You could actually have them in different places, right? This hardware could actually be in this panel, but still be part of this machine's network, right? So if you needed to add IO into a different machine, instead of having the PLCs communicate, let's say I wanted to add some hardwired IO over here so this PLC can connect to this IO and be able to bring that data back but still have it on that network that's an option as well and that's how you would do that here to show people where to physically place those modules so i'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of this mess because i'm sure uh, many of you if you've tried this before have run into this so you've got the option here from configure the default setting in ieb is physical connection point so you'll see it shows this crisscrossing you can choose logical connection point and this will make things a lot cleaner. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of show you that spaghetti mess before as you're kind of moving it around. And once you change this to a logical connection point, it's a lot nicer. Now, if I were to move this IO over to this panel, as I was just mentioning, one thing you'll notice is you see how it's still on this network because this is your architecture view. So this is where the devices are going to be physically laid out within your facility. So regardless of which enclosure I add this IO, it's still a part of this VLAN and this device level ring. So again, if you had this machine, but you needed to integrate additional IO that's going to move over here, 
you can do that and demonstrate that visually on your architecture view however you want to move things around, but they will stay physically connected because of what you have set up here in this network view. I hope that's all clear. So what I would do then is take my network view. I'm going to go ahead and clean this one up a bit because I don't like it. So I have the option here to auto distribute the devices across the topology. So it's going to go ahead and remove these around. I'm still not happy with that because I'm just really picky. So I would go ahead and I would move these back to where I wanted, but that gets rid of my crisscrosses or I can go into the connect mode and I can move those points and the devices around manually based on however I needed to see that. All right, so from this view, I can currently see my addresses. I can see my VLANs. If you wanted to better visualize some of those VLANs, you have the option up here to add unfiltering. So for example, you can choose to shade the VLANs. So for example, if I only wanted to see what is connected with VLAN 1, I would click on shading and VLAN 1. You'll see which devices are on that network or just look at VLAN 1 and 2. So again, if this is something where you're connecting from your machine to somebody else's and you only want to see the devices that are on your specific VLAN, you can just turn on that shading and it'll gray, to, gray out all of the, the other devices. So now I can easily turn that on. And if I were to change this device that resides within this DLR, if I wanted to change it to another addressing scheme, I can do that from here as well. Okay, the other piece that I did not demonstrate with DLR is adding in an ETAP. So if you have a device with a singular Ethernet port that's not capable of going into DLR. Uh, so if I were to, for example, come down here and grab, actually I'm going to grab another Compact Logix, but I'm going to grab one that's set up in dual IP mode as opposed to DLR mode. So I'm going to grab another L306ER. I can drag it up here. But I'm going to change this. So I'm going to change it from here from a do, um, sorry, device level ring to a DLR. Oh, sorry, it's adding it here to that network. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect that. If it will let me, it's not going to. So I'll go back here in my hardware view and I can disconnect it from here so I can modify my connection. I can change it around. So for here, set a Ethernet IP mode to a dual IP mode. So the two ports on here are no longer functioning as a DLR. They're functioning as two different IPs. So if I go back here to my network view, you'll notice what it's done is added an ETAP. So an ETAP is the device that lets you connect a single port uh, device into a DLR where you don't have the two port capability. So by disabling those two ports, I can now take this device, connect it here to this DLR, and the other port that's on here with a different IP address can go on to a different network. Okay, now one of the nice things is you might wonder why you'd spend all the time on this. This is now a great document that you can take, and if you're creating a proposal, you can take this information into a proposal, into a PowerPoint, or generate this really neat little list. So actually, let me show you the warnings first. So there's some error messages that have come up from this network view. So if you take a look at this warning, it says if you take a look at this switch, so this maintenance office switch, which is noted here, this switch supports multiple inline networks, which is multiple DLRs, which we're taking advantage of, but use of specific DLR ports for each network is required. The user must manually assign DLR ports using the table in this user manual. So if you're not familiar with how to set up the DLR ports, it's actually pointing you to the documentation. So if you were to Google 1783-UM007 or go into Rockwell's literature library, you can type in that part number or that manual number and it'll bring up the documentation. And if you scroll to table 37, it'll show you about those port settings. And some information for you as well, for maintenance office, the project has selected a gigabit port to interface with DLR, and that's because this entire switch is gigabit, but DLR supports a maximum of 100 meg. 
So this port should be configured for the speed. So if you're using an SFP fiber connection, you would want to choose 100 megs fiber. So when you're doing these uh, connections for this port, uh, their smart port settings are within the Stratic switches. So from the smart port, if you were to select that this is a 100 meg port or going onto DLR, it'll automatically configure that for you. You won't have to go in and change those settings. So those are the only warnings that we've got on this setup. So if I click on this button, it's going to generate an Ethernet report for me. So you'll see this has popped up in my web browser. This has come up in Chrome. So it's given me based on the network that I've set up. So this compact logics, it's going to show me the switch that I have on here. Each of the switch ports, which cable is connecting to those ports and which network those ports are going to. So port two is going to machine three. Port three is going to machine one, eight to two, nine to one, 10 to three and 11 to two as well. So if you've got someone that's in this panel or in this office area and they need to quickly see if someone's moved a cable around or where things should be, you know, if you've got the cables properly labeled, you can easily see that they're in the right ports based on the switch setup. Down here for the ring networks, it's actually going to show me for this machine DLR one I've built, what each node number is. So if I go back over here, and I view my node numbers, you know, these will all match that six, for example, is my compact logics. If I go over here, you know, this is where things are and I'll see the actual port coming out of that device. So for example, my compact logics is right here. So there's two ports on the bottom of the compact logics, A1 and A2. The right port is actually going to be connected to the wrappers left port, right? If we take a look at the wrapper, then it's right port with the other side coming out of it is going to be connected to the switch. So if we were to look at the ring network overview here, I can see that the connections going to the switch are from the wrapper. And if I look on the other side here, it's going into the labeler. And if I come over here, I can view if that's true. If I zoom in this maintenance switch, one side is going to the wrapper and the other side following this ring around is going to the labeler. So the information that you do put in here, whether it's going to be the cable lengths, the IP addresses, you know, the names that you're going to set in the hardware view for each one of those things. So the wrapper, the labeler and so on. Those are all generated in this report. So if you might wonder why would I put that in, this is giving you all of that information so that someone can easily connect those cables. Someone can easily program them, know what IP address to set. So if you're using 192.168.1 as your networking scheme, they just have to turn the dial on the front. If you're using an additional network scheme, they can just set those when that boots up. And you'll see we've got the same information for machine two and machine three. And then down here, it's a listing of our VLANs and the different subnets associated with those VLANs and whether or not they're in use. Okay, so we've got this report view that we can pull up. We also have the option from within IEB, and I like doing this one. You can export to PowerPoint. So let's give it a moment. You've got the, uh, the option to choose which IO or which hardware you want to bring into that view. I'm not going to bring any of my hardware. I just want to bring my architecture and my network views. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK, save that file and open it up. So if I now open up PowerPoint, it's going to give me this architecture view that I created. So all of that time I spent, let me just zoom in, moving things around on the architecture view. This is now something oh, I added that last one in and didn't put it anywhere. That's OK. The time I spent on this can again be easily brought up in a presentation or used in a proposal and the same thing for this network view as well. It's going to show me all of the features that I have turned on. So for example, addressing, I could turn that off, turn on these cable links and when I exported it from here, I would get the cable links as well. But the, this gives me a really nice and clear overview. So if you're wrapping up a project or proposing a project and you run a really show you know, this is what the programmers need. This is what people need from a digital perspective. And this is what you need from a physical perspective on where to put the hardware and where to run the cables. 
this is a great overview of those networks and how to put these DLRs and connect them together. So we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and uh, see if there's any questions in the Q&A that need to be answered. All right, well, I think that's it in terms of questions. Thank you all for joining me. This recording will be available afterwards and we will send out both the link to download that uh, Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet guide, as well as I'll send out the file that I generated today during today's live demo so that you can access that. And if you wanted to play around with it yourself, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Amanda Fletcher afterwards, and we can answer any questions that you may have.